Hi, welcome to lecture 32 where we're going to talk about interferometers. Now, an interferometer is a particular setup that has a variety of applications in certain fairly fundamental physics experiment, experiments. I'm going to talk about two in particular, which is the michelson morley experiment um, and LIGO. So this one is from about the 1880s, this one in the 2010s. So very different um, times, very different sort of science that's being explored, but actually very similar setup. Before we can go into the details there, let's talk about what a general interferometer is. So this is the setup I've drawn here. What I imagine is I put a laser, right? And the laser shoots a single color of light. I've drawn in two colors um, to show you the different paths the light takes, but it's really just a single um, color laser, like a you know sine wave of a particular wavelength. That laser shoots its light at a beam splitter. Now a beam splitter is just a fancy term for essentially having nothing but a piece of glass here. And that's diagonal. So what's going to happen is the light's going to hit it, the surface, and some of it gets reflected, some of it enters the um, this piece of glass and exits the other and the other side in the same direction that it entered it. Right? It refracts and this side refracts again and it leaves in the same direction and it entered it. But because some of it gets reflected, the effect is that some light moves up some light moves across. Right? The reflected light, go, light moves up, the other light moves across. We call those two different paths, like those two sort of, um, lengths here, we call those the arms of the interferometer. Right. So this is one arm and this is the other arm. So some of the light, light I've drawn in green, but remember it's all the same color as far as the laser goes. It's just in a diagram that I've used different colors. It goes up, bounces back of a mirror, goes down. Then, yes, yeah, some of it gets reflected back. We don't care, but some of it's going to pass through and go down. And the light that initially went through, it's going to bounce back of a mirror here, and some of it, some of it's going to get reflected down there. Again, some of it's going to pass back through, gets lost to us. We don't care. Some of it, as I said, gets reflected. And so the two the two light beams that got split up, the just two different paths, they get recombined here. Now because those those two paths, they might be of different lengths, um, it means this recombination has is, is a recombination of two light beams that might no longer be in phase, right? Because it's a different path length, this is a well path length difference. Right? If this is length L1, and this is length L2, then the path length difference delta R is equal to L2 minus L1. I mean, either one could be longer than the other. We don't know. I've drawn L2 longer than L1. That's a bit arbitrary. Um, times times two, times two because the light travels well L one up and L one down. Whereas here it travels L two this way and L two back. So it travels twice L two here, twice L one here. So the path length difference is twice the difference between those two arm lengths. So right, this part here, this part here, that's the same. You don't really have to worry about that very much at all. So what you're going to get is you're going to detect constructive or destructive interference depending on whether or not this path length is equal to a whole number of wavelength or halfway between whole numbers of wavelength, right? So, um, so the detector is going to pick up light if delta r is some whole number n times the wavelength, so that you know, n is um, the whole number. What am I doing? Can I draw a whole number sign? The whole number, like this. It could be zero, it could be positive or negative, depending which one's longer, but if it's an integer, 
right then um, this is going to be constructive so it's going to be bright here um, but it's going to be going to be pick up or detect darkness if delta r is n plus a half times lambda right for so a half or three halves five halves the story you know right the condition you know you understand what has to happen for constructive or destructive interference now in general it is extremely difficult to set up this experiment or a version of this experiment in such a way that those two path lengths are identical down to the same you know a couple of nanometers i mean it's really hard to do like how would you move a mirror by you know a nanometer it's difficult to do but more often than not, we can use the setup not to worry about what is the path length difference, but how is the path length difference changing over time. So, for example, if one mirror was moving away very slowly, then I could see the interference pattern here changing as the path length difference sort of cycles through integer numbers of wavelengths and the halfway between point. And so, what you can do is you can Detect extremely low speeds, for example. That's just one application. Um, let's just do a quick sort of sample calculation, right? Suppose we use a visible light, um, and lambda is, say, 600 nanometers. All right, so what's that? So yellowish, I guess. Um, then, so what does it mean? Path length difference, right, is 2 L1 minus L2 minus L1. So let's say this mirror here is slowly moving. Right, so this mirror, I guess we could call this mirror two and this mirror one. Right. Say mirror two slowly moving. Right. So then, well, for every three hundred nanometers that this mirror moves. The path length difference is going to go through a whole cycle because 300 nanometers extra means the path length the increases by 600 nanometers. 300 extra nanometers there, 300 extra nanometers back. So, so every 300 nanometers um, corresponds to one full. Um, wavelength in path length difference 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 change if you know what I mean like the path length difference changes the path length difference between the two, two arms that changes um, every 300 nanometers you get 300 nanometers there 300 nanometers back 600 nanometers one whole wavelength so say the, the mirror is moving Right, if V is, I don't know, one nanometer per second, that's a fairly low speed, right, it'll be easily detectable. Because it means it takes, you know, every five minutes, every 300 seconds, um, the interference pattern um, goes through, through one whole cycle. Now, in practice, when you've got a beam of finite width, and it has to be because a laser has to have a finite width to remain a laser, not spread out, um, you're actually going to see on the detector a, a pattern of you know bright and dark, because depending on if you're on the left side of the beam or the right side of the beam, you're going to have ever so slightly different path length differences. Right? But we're not going to worry about that. We just assume, okay, either this is constructive or destructive. Right, so, so in this, this so one nanometer per second is a very low speed. But given this, you can pick up speeds, measure speeds that are way slower than this. Right, so it's one thing, one application, I guess, is just to measure very tiny speeds. But it's not the only one. We're going to talk about some way more interesting applications. So that's the basics of an interferometer. Now, we want to study those two examples, um, and they're both very important in the history of physics, I would say. So let's get started on the first one, the Michelson-Mulley experiment. 
let's begin with the Mickelson Morley experiment. Um, so this was those two people were Albert Mickelson and Edward Morley, and this was essentially an experiment carried out in Cleveland, Ohio, 1887. Um, though, though there were some, there was a prior experiment that Mickelson did with a similar setup, um, so another interferometer, when he was, I think he was in um, Potsdam in Germany or maybe Berlin. Not entirely sure, I don't quite remember, about six years earlier, where he set up an interferometer, but it didn't quite work. Um, and I can tell you later why it didn't work. It's kind of funny, actually. Um, so they were, I think, M Morley in particular was known for, or later um, became known, for measuring with high accuracy the atomic weight of oxygen. He, he was more of a chemist, um, but you know, he's still, he was he's sort of famous for, for that and for being part of this. Um, Mickelson was the, incidentally the first American to receive a Nobel Prize in Science in, I think, 1907, if I'm not mistaken. So, let's figure out what he did, right? They used an interferometer, but for what? And, and what, you know, what was, what was going on here? So, you've got to take a bit of a step back to understand um, what's, what they were trying to do. So, in about the 1860s, Maxwell right, wrote down his equations um, of electromagnetism, the so-called Maxwell's equations. And they encompass all the laws about electric and magnetic fields. Now, from those equations, you can derive a wave equation right, for the electric fields and the magnetic fields, the E fields and B fields. And as you hopefully remember, if you've got a, um, a wave equation, what's determined in that equation is the speed, right? With the string, it was square root of tension over the mass density, right? That was something we're not allowed to change. Waves of different wavelengths can exist in a string, but they all have to have the same speed. Same thing here, and the speed is given by 1 over the square root of epsilon naught mu naught, and those two constants, of course, determine the strength of electrostatic forces, um, or electric forces, and magnetic forces. So this was understood. And then the next 20 years since that those were first published, you know, people tried to figure out all the sort of consequences of that, a variety of phenomena, um, and so on. And the question came up. So this is the speed, right? But, but in what reference frame? Right, so let me explain this question a bit. Imagine you have a wave on a string. Right? So you have a string, you stretch it, you send a wave down it. You measure the speed of the wave. The speed of the wave is defined relative to the string itself. Right? If you do the experiment on a moving train, the train moves 10 meters per second, your wave moves 20 meters per second, well then, if the wave moves in the same direction as the train, somebody outside the train will see the wave traveling at 30 meters per second because it's on a train that is itself moving 10. Right? And so you're adding the speed of the train, the velocity of the train, to the velocity of the wave. That's fairly clear. If you've got water waves in a water tank, right, you can measure the, the speed, but if the tank itself is, say, on a boat or on a train or who cares where, and it's moving, then you know, if you look at the the wave motion from the outside, you'd be adding this the velocity of, say, the tank itself. Right? So the reference frame matters. In most cases, for most waves, it's well defined what the reference frame is. Now, this is not true in the case of Maxwell's equation because they appear to require no medium of which you could measure the speed. Right? They're not waves in water where I can say, okay, the whole lake is moving, or whatever the situation is. So, so people sort of hypothesized um, that there might be, so is, is there some background um, absolute reference frame? or some invisible medium. Some kind of 
some kind of substance, I suppose, that is everywhere and light can travel through it. And the speed of light C is defined with respect to that that substance. Like imagine the universe is filled with this invisible goo, I suppose, and um, light travels with the speed of light, with this speed, uh, relative to that, that goo. Now the goo isn't called goo, um, it's called the ether. Not to be confused with the chemical substance ether, which has, doesn't have the A in the front, right? But the ether, is the, the mysterious ether. So the question became, okay, if there is an ether, then what is the rest frame of the ether? Is the Earth moving through the ether? Like, is the ether at rest with respect to the sun or, or something else? Um, so the question became, what is the rest frame of the ether? What's this invisible substance? We might only be able to detect it by measuring the speed of light. And this is where Michelson and Morley come in with an interferometer that is designed to detect exactly um, that. So let me sketch this out for you. Okay, so I drew out the actual situation of the uh, michelson morley experiment. Now, this looks more complicated, so let me explain to you what's going on. This is just a picture of a normal interferometer. Here's my light source, and actually, they didn't have lasers, um, so they used, I think, an oil lamp to, to get light that they didn't suitably, um, you know, have a small slit or something that let, that let it fall through that. Not entirely sure about the details of their setup. So they had a light source, they had their beam splitter right here. Now, this is the top mirror, this is the right mirror here, and this is the detector right so ignore the other parts right now so it's just the normal sort of crosswise setup that i've just showed you moments ago now what if if there is this mysterious ether then chances are the earth and this device is clearly on earth the earth is moving through the ether at some speed right? so this mysterious invisible goo that forms the rest frame of light, you know, it fills the universe and the Earth is moving through it. There are sorts of other theories to how it might detect it, what effect it might have on light, but we're just going to deal with this one. So that means our interferometer as a whole is moving. Now I'm going to do it such a way that we can pretend the whole interferometer is moving to the right. So the interferometer. It's moving right with some speed v. Right. So what that means is the light from the, the source, you can pretend it's a laser, hits the beam splitter, this piece of glass, and let's follow the um, let's follow the green ray first, right? It gets reflected. Now while it is moving from here to here, we let's call this time when this happens t zero. So T0 um, is the time when the light bounces off. So this is my, I define T equals 0 because what happens before isn't important. The light is going to start getting reflected here, but by the time it reaches the mirror, the mirror has moved a certain distance, right? Namely, the distance, well, it moved with speed V for the time it took the light to get there. And we're going to do the math in a second. Then it bounces off, but in the time that the light takes to get from here to here, to get back down, right, the beam splitter that was right underneath this point here has moved over. Right, so the light moves up, the beam splitter, this is my fingers, let me use a pencil here, the pencil is the beam splitter, right, at the tip of the pencil. So the light moves up, the beam splitter moves, and to hit the beam splitter again, it has to hit it over here because the device as a whole is moving to the right while the light is traveling. The blue ray 
and they're all the same color, of course, but the one drawn in blue goes through. Now, as the ray moves from here to here, this mirror is, is escaping, right, because the whole thing is moving to the right. So it sort of has to play catch up, bounce off, but then as it goes backwards, the bean splitter is coming towards it, right, so it meets it again there, and then um, gets 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 reflected down at a detector and recombine. So this is what I've drawn here. It's just a normal interferometer, but I've drawn the mirror at different times and this mirror at different times. I'd notice that this time when the green one bounces of this one might be the same time that the blue one bounces of this one. Right? But because the light is continuous, you're going to get recombination one way or another. A little bit more of, an, on, of a complicated um, situation because a whole experimental setup is moving um, through the ether. So let's figure out the time it takes. So the speed of light is c with respect to the ether. So let's call those times. So this is time up, the time from here to here, time down, from here to here is going to be time right and time left. Fairly intuitive, right? So it bounces off at time equals t up. Let's figure out what is t up, t down, t left, and t right. What happens after it's hit the beam split like the second time or before it hits the first time, it doesn't really matter for the experiment because the light rays are both doing the same thing. They're recombined or not yet split, so that won't have any effect on the interference pattern that we see. Only where they follow different paths. Okay, so let's figure out the time it takes from here to here t up. Well, t up is going to be the, oh, we should define the lengths. Um, no, the arms, we're going to make the same, the same length. So we're going to say this is, this is length L. And this is also how I'm going to kind of draw this um, from here to here is also length L. It's sort of hard to draw without um, interfering with the rest of the diagram. But so equal lengths doesn't actually matter too much it's just slightly different um, but it makes our life a bit easier if we assume those lengths are equal okay now how far has that mirror moved it has moved by its speed times the time t up because that's the time it took the light to get from there to there um, so let's figure that one out we're gonna get the speed of light times the time up, that is the, so speed times time of travel time from here to here, that's the distance the light has traveled, right? Speed times time. What distance is this geometrically? Well, it's, it's the, um, it's the hypotenuse of this triangle here, right? So that's, what am I doing? C, let me, colon, right? You're trying to calculate this. And I'm doing it like this. C, if you're confused. No, that's not an equal sign. Sorry. C, T up. Speed times time, that's the distance that the light travels between here and here. That's equal to this squared plus this squared take the square root. So that's L squared plus this distance here and that distance there is V times T up all squared, because we're applying Pythagoras, all right? So this is just Pythagoras, and v t up is the distance the mirror um, travels, the top mirror, in time t up, which is the name we give to the time interval the light takes to get from there to, to the mirror. It's speed times time from here to here. That's the distance the mirror has moved. All right. So that's equal to C times T up, speed of light times the time of travel. So we can simplify this. And as a squared, we're going to get C squared T up squared is L squared plus v squared t up squared. Um, and then we can rearrange this further. 
and it doesn't take much, just a little bit of algebra for you to figure out that t up is equal to l divided by the square root of c squared minus v squared. Well, I'm just rearranging this, um, factoring out the t up squared and eventually taking the square root. So this is the, the time it takes from here to here. Right? Depends on the speed of light, of course, but also on the length and how quickly this mirror is moving sideways through the ether. Now, t down. How long does it take for light to come back down? It's by the symmetry of it, it's going to be the same. Right? You can easily prove that. So here, I'm just going to write the same as t up. Right? So the total time that the light travels by itself without the, the other, the, the beam blown, blown, uh, be, the beam drawn in blue being with it, like the time the green one does by itself, is, is essentially twice this. Right? So let's call this t perpendicular because it's the, the rate that moves perpendicular to the line of travel of the interferometer is t up plus t down, which is just 2L over the square root of c squared minus v squared. Right, so this is the total time, total travel time of, um, what it means, right, in the um, upwards arm. Right, going up, coming back down along this arm that's, that's upwards. Okay. Now, what about the other one? What about the directed travel of the this one going to the right in the right arm it also gets affected by the motion right it goes in a straight line but the on the on the way there to the right the this mirror over here is moving away from it so the the light ray has to play catch up on the way back the next target the beam split is coming towards it making it a bit a bit easier um, so t right Is, is going to be, well, distance over speed. Distance is L. Um, and then the speed. So the speed is C, but, but because the mirror is moving away from it, I can just write, I can just take away the speed of the mirror because the light is moving. Um, C, like the, the speed of the light relative to the mirror is C minus V, right? If the light is moving, 10 meters per second it's not obviously but imagine it's 10 meters per second the meter was moving one the, the mirror was, mo was moving one meter per second then i can treat the situation as if the light were going nine meters per second right, it's going nine meters per second relative to the target mirror so i can write this as c minus v right you could also calculate this as l plus vt is c times t right gives you the um, same thing I'll write this down just in case what i said was confusing so it's maybe even easier right um, Distance traveled by the light is L, the length of the arm, plus the distance the mirror has moved by the time it gets hit. So you can rearrange this to get this. And then T left, can't spell, it's going to be say left, is by analogy C plus L over C plus V, or to spell it out, C times the time it takes to travel left, right? So the time it takes the light to go from having bounced off to hit the um, hit the beam split again is well, it has to travel L, but the beam split is coming towards towards it, so it's V times the time it was traveling left, right? And so that's how I get 
this when I rearrange this to isolate T left. Take this to the other side, factor out T left, L over C, C plus V. So that means the, um, the total travel time on the right arm, there and back, right there and back, is, let's call it T parallel, because it's parallel to the direction of travel, the infer infer interferometer is moving right. So this is going to be the time it takes to go right, plus the time it takes to go back left. That is equal to, well, those two added together, L over C minus V plus L over C plus V, right? So this is the total time um, spent, total travel time in the right arm. Traveling right, traveling left. Um, we can rearrange it a little bit if we um, if we want to. Um, so let's put it all into one fraction. So I'm just going to do this for you. We're going to get L times C plus V plus L C minus V over C minus V C plus V. So, you remember how to combine fraction lines, I hope. Um, so, that's going to be the top, right? Just leaves me with 2CL divided by, uh, because, you know, L times V, L minus V, divided by A minus B times A plus B is A squared minus B squared, right? So, I've got C squared minus V squared. Um, in the in the bottom there. All right. So we found the time that the light spends in the in the top arm. That was our calculation in green, and we found the time that the light spends in the um, the blue arm, the one to the right. Was the calculation done in blue? Now they're not the same. Right. Let's find the, we want to find a path length difference, so find the actual path length of each one. So path length of top arm, and I'm going to call this um, R perpendicular, right, R because it's, I guess, distance. We've been labeling path length that light takes by R perpendicular because it's the direction perpendicular to the direction of travel, like we used t perpendicular here. That's going to be the speed times the time. Right, that's just kinematics. So that is going to be equal to, this was our answer, 2cl over the square root of c squared minus v square squared. Um, I'm going to take the c downstairs. It's going to be 2l divided by 1 minus v squared over c squared. Like this. If you ever come to study special relativity, you'll see this sort of factor, the 1 minus v squared over c squared, come up everywhere. Right? Because we're sort of working our way um, towards the understanding of relativity. So this is the path length in the top arm. Let's continue. The path length of the right arm. So that's the total length there and back. Distance that the light travels is R parallel because the right arm is parallel to the direction of travel. Let's see the speed of light times the time, kinematics. Well, I've got an expression for the time right here. So that is going to be 2C. As you see here, I'm going to multiply it by C. I get 2C squared L over c squared minus v squared, no square root, right? This one was not square rooted. Um, I can also take the c squared downstairs here. So you get 2l over 1 minus v squared over c squared without the square root. So those two lengths, they look very, very similar. Except in one of them, I take the square root of the denominator. Um, in the other one, I, I don't. Okay. 
So now we have the path length of each um, of those two paths. So now, I mean, we can just find delta r. I guess we should should write it down at least once. Um, let's do that. So delta r well, it's equal to one minus the other. I guess which one's bigger? Um, because v squared over c squared is smaller than one, right? The denominator is smaller than one, which makes the square root the bigger one. Think about this if it doesn't make sense to you. 1 minus v squared over c squared, of course it's not actually that important, um, minus 2l, 1 minus v squared over c squared, uh, without the square root. That's my path length difference, right? And the question is, well, how many wavelengths is this? Right? Is it is this a whole number of wavelengths or a half in between number of wavelengths? That's going to determine um, whether it's constructive or destructive. All right. And, and now, so what does this tell us? I mean, we might detect some pattern, but given that we, it's sort of hard to make the L's exactly the same in the first place of the two paths, I mean, how do we know it's not just a measurement error? So here comes, in a way, the ingenious part of the michelson morley experiment. We're now going to rotate our um, apparatus. We're going to rotate our interferometer, right? So that's what we're going to do. So here's what we're going to do. So now, rotate the interferometer by 90 degrees. What does that mean? It means the parallel arm becomes perpendicular, by that I mean um, always to direction of motion through the ether, or the hypothesized ether, so I mean, the little star here and here, right, to the direction of motion through the ether. And the perpendicular one, the green one, becomes parallel. Right? Because I'm, I'm taking my, my interferometer um, and I'm turning it. I could imagine I put it on a table and I turn my table. That's hard to do without messing it up. So in reality, what you can do is you just wait. Because the Earth is moving, right, 30 kilometers per second around the Sun, but after three months, it has moved a quarter of a circle, so it's turned its motion by 90 degrees. So you can just turn your apparatus by waiting for the Earth to do the turning for you. That's how you would do it in practice, in order not to mess with the sort of fine tuning of your setup. So, so what would it look like? So if I wait three months, um, I mean, I'm going to ignore the rotation of the Earth around its, its own axis for now, just to keep my life a little bit, bit simpler. So initially, um, my, my setup might look like this, right? Here's my mirror. Here's my mirror. Here's the detector. And here was my laser, right? So it goes in, bounces. And then after, you know, say 1.5 months, it might look sort of like this. The beam is now here. The laser is here. Um, the, oops. It's like this is here. The other mirror is here. The detector is here. And then after another 1.5 months, 
I'm going to have the laser now pointing up. The beam splitter has rotated to be like this. There's one mirror here. There's one mirror here. This was the blue one, right? The blue arm that went in this way. Let me just indicate this. This is the blue one. This one was the green one. Right? Now the green one is doing this. The blue one is doing this. And now we're over here. The detector over here, the green one, is, if that's always the one that reflects first, it's going to go here and here. And the blue one is going straight through there. All right, so just by waiting, letting the Earth rotate around the sun, the Earth turns by 90 degrees. So with it, my setup turns by 90 degrees relative to the direction of the ether. Right? If the Earth is moving one way through the ether, well, now after three months, it's moving this way through the ether. So that is what I've tried to represent here. So what it means is our interference pattern shifts. So the path length difference gradually changes. Right here in this diagonal setup, if the path, if I'm still moving to the right, which we are, right, this is the direction through the ether, I'm it's going to be the same for both of them because it's you know they're both sort of diagonal calculation a bit more complicated but you know you can do it pathing different gradually changes from or well, we started out with the this value here right from 2l over 1 minus v squared over c squared square root minus 2l 1 minus v squared over c squared 2, the same thing, but the other way. So let me write minus that same value. Because you've gradually flipped the arms. Right, so if, if at one point the um the green arm right was the um had a slightly longer path by you know i don't know what a good value is by 100 nanometers well after after 3 months the blue one is 100 nanometers longer and so you go through all the intermediate stages of interference patterns let's put some number to, numbers to this right, let's work out what the actual values are in this sort of setup. But I hope the concept so far makes sense. Feel free to pause the video, go back, think about it some more, right? Um, what, what's happening as the as the interferometer spins. Right? You don't have to think about the Earth moving, doing a spinning, just imagine you take this and you rotate it. It's just for practical reasons that we don't want to rotate a really sensitive setup like that. In fact, the reason the original experiment by Mickelson in 1881 didn't work was because he was doing it in some, you know, lab basement somewhere and the wagons outside in the street caused too much of a vi vibration of the equipment that there was just too much of a measurement error to detect anything. And only in 1887 they set it up in a much more sort of sophisticated way with greater error mitigation um, on a sort of table that I think was floating in some fluid, I'm not entirely sure, um, but somebody to sort of pad any external um, shaking of the device. But in principle, you could imagine, take the setup and spin it by 90 degrees, right? So what was parallel to the direction of motion through the ether is now perpendicular um, and vice versa. And so you go from whatever that value is to minus that value, or like that value of pathing path the other way. Right? The, the green one is longer. Well, now the blue one is longer. All right, let's work out the numbers. Let's crunch some numbers here. So we have um, some estimates. So if you use the Earth, right, and we wait three months, V is going to be three, 30 kilometers per second. Or we just, you know, use the motion of the Earth. Um, in fact, we can't really help that because we can't go really fast than that on Earth in the first place, and we can't stop the Earth. So we're sort of stuck with this being the value of V. 
and c the speed of light is 300,000 kilometers per second 300 million meters per second um, so what do we get we get that v over c this over this is 10 to the minus 4 and for our maths we're going to need v squared over c squared right that's the quantity that that shows up here and here um, so that's going to be 10 to the minus 8 of course no units it's a ratio of speeds so that implies that 1 minus v squared over c squared the quantity that we need that comes up in our expression for the path length difference is well 1 minus this okay 0 0.9999999990 all right okay the other quantity we need is this Well, we can do an approximation here if we know this one. Um, let's put a binomial approximation. Let's give you the answer. Or we can just work it out. Sort of halfway between this and 1. Okay. So, extremely similar, right? Both really close to 1, those those denominators here. So, the path, the path the light travels is 2L and the teensiest bit longer because the denominator is ever so slightly smaller than 1. And in the other direction, the path length is twice the arm length, what you would expect if the thing was at rest. But then, what did I do? Took one square root too many. Okay, I'm, I'm clearly messing this up. Um, there's no square root in the second part. If you were confused, again, it's my, my fault. Maybe you caught the error. That should have been the, what it says. Um, so, this one here, again, 2L, what you would expect if the, if the interferometer wasn't moving there and back again. But then now it's, it gets increased a teensy bit because it gets divided by, by this, which is, which is this. All right. So, um... Now, what is L? In the actual Michelson-Mulli experiment, L was 11 meters. So they had a pretty big setup. Actually, what they did is they cheated a bit, or they did something smart, which instead of having one mirror here, they sort of bounce it back and forth across the table a couple of times, so they sort of travel the arm more than once, and travel each arm more than once. It doesn't change the math. I mean, it changed a little bit, but it doesn't change the underlying principle or the concept. Right? So it just you know, makes our calculation a tiny bit more complicated because the geometry has changed, but the idea is exactly the same. So we can pretend it was an 11 meter long arm. So with L 11 meters, we're going to find that a path length difference, which is 2L over 1 minus V squared over C squared minus 2L over 1 minus V squared over C squared. I think I put a square root here. And this one is a bit bigger than this one. So actually it's a smaller quantity, never mind, we're going to get a negative number here. Um, that's 22 meters, 2L, divided by 0 0.9999999995 minus 22 meters, divided by um, 0 0.9999999990. All right, well, you, you work that out. You're going to get 22.0000000022 meters minus 22.0000001 meters, which comes to 0 0.0000001 meters. Passing difference, which, you know, millimeters, micrometers, okay, that's 110 nanometers. That's the path length difference we get a, a, just because of the motion of our device through the ether. Right, that is where this comes from. All right, now, how much is that in terms of wavelengths? Well, let's say for simplicity, um, I've got lambda is 550 nanometers, but it's a greenish, I suppose. 
Um, so that means this is exactly one fifth of a cycle difference. Might be hard to detect, it's not exactly the same, but then over time, right, it's going to change to one fifth of a cycle the other way. So, so we start one fifth cycle out of phase. Then, as time goes by, we go through constructive interference. And when they're exactly in, in phase, that's the diagonal point that I drew earlier. And it's this point here. When they're perhaps they've rotated by 45 degrees, now the two arm lengths are the same. This Never mind the motion. Um, the motion is going to change this arm length the same as it changes this one. And then we're going to end again after you know three months of waiting for the device to turn by 90 degrees due to the motion of the Earth. We're going to end one fifth cycle out of phase the other way. Um, and it's easily observable, right? Easily observable. Now, this real calculation would be a bit more complicated, but we're not going to do that. A tiny bit more complicated, or maybe a lot more complicated. Um, actually, a tiny bit. Because we don't actually know if the sun is at rest. Um, if sun moving through the ether. Right? So imagine this is the sun and there's the little earth. The earth goes around it, but the sun as a whole is moving, including the earth. So then I'd, I'd have to, the earth is going this way, but I'd have to add those two velocity vectors to get the actual motion of the earth through the ether. Right? So I would have to um, add V earth and the sun I have to add them as vectors of course the, the direction matters um, the way i'd usually draw that or the way that people talked about it was okay this is the sun and the earth is here right doing its thing going around pretend the sun is at rest but maybe the mysterious ether is like if the earth sun is going through the ether you can think of it as the ether sort of streaming past us right the same way you hold your hand out of a car window and you're like, oh, there's wind, right? Even if it's actually the car that's moving. So we call this the um, the ether wind. And you now you can do the calculation. What we just did, a little bit more complicated in terms of the geometry, but you can figure out, depending on the direction of the wind, what are you going to measure if you do this experiment, you know, maybe across the whole year, for example. And so the idea was, can we find the direction of the ether wind and its speed? Um, and and can we then co ha use that to answer our original question, which, if you recall, was what is the rest frame of the ether? So that's another way of saying, well, what is the ether wind, right? Ether streaming past, how fast, which direction? Okay, that tells us how fast we are moving relative to the ether. So what did they find? That's the theory, right? That we should see this one fifth of a cycle phase difference and then after 1.5 months we should find nothing and then we find 1.5 the other way maybe we you know we might start a different point in the cycle depending which way we're going but but that's what we should find this shift over time um, so what's the observation nothing they did not find ether wind. They did not find this gradual phase shift over time. They found nothing. The interference pattern just sat there and did absolutely not change at all. So 
the Mikkelsen Mull experiment is in a way perhaps the or at least one of the most important non discoveries in science history. Right? They looked and looked and they found nothing. This creates a big puzzle. What is going on with light? Like the rest frame, I mean, made sense, right? Light moving with a certain speed. That's what the theory says. Well, in what frame? How can there not be an answer? It's a big puzzle. Um, you know, what's up with light? What's up with light and reference frames? And then, you know, people were puzzled. They spent time thinking and having all sorts of ideas. There were some mathematical developments um, by Lorentz, sort of account for this non-discovery. He developed what's called the Lorentz transformations, a different way to trans transform between reference frames. Um, Lorentz, so the TZ, or TZ. Um, but then, this was the 1890s, but then it was really sort of all put together in a coherent, conceptually sound way um, by, um, by Einstein in 1905. That's the theory of special relativity, which you might do in a um, future course. That's the michelson mole experiment. It's extremely important in physics. It's sort of one of those things that forced the development of new physics, in this case, special relativity. Um, so, super important is this non-discovery of the ether. And, and nowadays, the ether is sort of like the... I think there's like an ether society in the same way that's like a flat earth society. It's sort of this, this old idea that it's no longer viable. Right? There's, there's no evidence of any sort of space goo that fills all of the universe. Um, special relativity, you know, does away with it. We don't need it. Um, but it's it's hugely important for the in the history of physics. Um, if you want to find out more about this whole logic, the thinking about it, the conceptual ideas that went into it, the history of it, um, there's a fantastic book I'd recommend um, by, by Harvey Brown. called um, Physical Relativity. And a lot of it is, is more advanced, thinking about interpretations and understanding special relativity. But the first couple of chapters treat a lot of the history um, and the sort of philosophy behind stuff like the michelson mull experiment and, and you know, related, related ideas. He's a philosopher of physics at, at Oxford, um, whom I took a couple of seminars with when I was studying there. So, Fantastic book. Fantastic book. Highly recommend it. Okay, that's it for the michelson mull experiment. Okay, you're probably exhausted now after all that math. That's fair enough. So let's talk about the other um, interferometer, the other specific experiment I want to talk about. And um, let's not do as much math. We're only going to do a, a little bit more. Let's talk more about the concept. So this is the this is LIGO, um, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. And this is what a couple of years ago um, discovered gravitational waves. Um, so gravitational waves, they're somewhat like electromagnetic waves, except instead of oscillating electric and magnetic fields, it's an, it's an oscillating gravitational field. Now, what does that mean? How can a gravitational field be oscillating? Isn't it like Newton's law of gravity? Well, there is um, the general theory of relativity, um, which is the most sophisticated understanding of gravity, and one of the predictions it makes is that you can have waves in the gravitational field. Now, the gravitational field itself is really understood in the context of general relativity as a changing of the local geometry. Like local, I mean like in a particular, in a particular point, the geometry changes. What do I mean by that? Let me give you a little picture. Let me show you a picture. So imagine I draw a circle. Right? So I draw a perfect circle. And then I change the geometry of it. 
that maybe the distances in one direction change compared to the distance in another direction. So again, of stretching and um, squishing and changing what angles look like in different directions. So um, straight lines are no longer straight lines, circles are no longer circles, just based on, for example, how a length, the notion of length is defined. Can make this mathematics precise it gets complicated very quickly um, but it is, it is well understood right so if i have a circular object and a gravitational wave passes through it it would do what this um this little simulation does right my perfect circle gets deformed and those gravitational waves they get created really just by the most sort of violent gravitational processes in the universe. And these gravitational waves that are remotely detectable are um, only created by very violent processes, such as two neutron stars um, colliding and forming a black hole, for example. So you've got some violent process out there. And if you go to the, the LIGO website, they've got lots of really cool resources. I mean, in particular, I recommend that that you. Um, where did I? Where did I? Um, go here for the education resources recommended reading and video. There's a whole video series and a whole science of the device, um, of gravitational waves and all of that, um, and so all sorts of other um, recommended resources here if this stuff interests you. So, you've got this gravitational wave that gets created far out in space, many thousands of light years away, or maybe just some far long distance away, they spread out. So imagine like at the other end of the of a lake, somebody throws a pebble in the water. Right? And you could have measured the wave on your end of the lake. And there's going to be a tiny, tiny ripple in the geometry. So what you do, let's see if we can find some good pictures here. Um, this is of more of the neutron star um, mergers, I suppose, of the actual stuff that they discover rather than the device itself. Um, let me go back here. Um, let's look at this picture up there. And you can see that there's the like the, the buildings, I guess, sort of, you know, the labs are, the offices are. And you've got these long lines going in two directions. Those are the arms of the interferometer. The interferometer, they're four kilometers long. Right? It's not on a tabletop. It's an interferometer four kilometers long. And the mirrors at the far ends... They're sort of suspended from strings in, in certain ways so that they're really, um, so that any vibration from the outside gets done. It's an extraordinarily precise setup. You can actually find it on Google Maps. So here's, here's Washington, right? Um, so one of the, the sites where they build it is at Hanford. So, um, Bellingham is, is up here, up there. Um, and this is on just on the east side. You go down the um, I-5 and across the mountains I-90, and you can you can get there. Let's zoom in. You can see from space those two arms of the of the interferometer. So they're four kilometers long, right? About two and a half miles each. Straight line. So that some some laser gets created here. It passes through a beam splitter. One arm is this way. One arm is that way. Right? Not 11 meters like the mickelson Morley one, no, four kilometers long. Okay, and, you know, they have trips, probably not right now, but, I mean, it, if you ever get a chance to like, visit one of those, or have like, an open day or something, please, please use it, right? It's, it's great stuff. In the meantime, look around their, their website. Um, so they detect these tiny ripples in the geometry of space that is gravitational Waves. So you use the waves, you use light, which is a wave, to detect another type of waves, namely um, gravitational waves. Okay, let's do a little bit of math just to figure out how big those gravitational waves actually are and like how sensitive this device is. So here's my drawing of the device. It's just an interferometer, but with very long arms that clearly go off the page here, right? And my detector um, is down there. The laser that they use, actually an infrared laser with a wavelength, I think it's 1064 nanometer. So it's, you know, a little bit longer than what the human eye can see, infrared, right? But but not by much. We can see up to about 700 nanometers. It's about 1.5 times, 
times um, the wavelength that we can detect with our naked eye. Of course, it doesn't change anything. Everything works the same. Okay, so now we imagine a gravitational wave passes through the Earth. So how strong would such a gravitational wave B. Well, you can sort of predict that a little bit from understanding relativity, crunching a lot of numbers, um, running it through some simulations. And what you find is that you get a certain value h, and explain what it is in just a second, that is about 10 to the minus 23. h is the ratio by which a length changes. So what does it mean? It means if you have got one meter, that goes to 1.0000000000000000000000 how many do you have 18 21 22 23 meters so it's a teensy change in the length one meter becomes this or maybe you know not point zero point nine 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 meters right it changes by 1 over 10 to the 23 that's the fractional change it's utterly minute and it's the strongest gravitational waves you can expect to pass through the earth so for our four kilometer long arm let's imagine make our keep our life simple let's suppose only one arm changes that perpendicular to each other and as you saw with those moving points the d-shaping circle one would get shorter as the other one gets longer but let's not care about that let us pretend one of them gets slightly longer by from you know per meter it goes to one point that many meters so four kilometers becomes well four kilometers plus Four times ten to the minus twenty-three kilometers. Right, that's my change. What is that? Well, I mean that is going to be change in length is four times ten to the minus twenty meters because a kilometer is um, ten to the three. So I'm left with ten to the minus twenty, which is I think about one. Ten thousandth um, of the size of a proton. You can see how utterly minute those changes are. Um, so, well, how many, what part of the cycle is that? Well, it's going to change by twice as much because the thing is traveling there and back. But again, we're just going to do a very rough estimate. Factor of two doesn't really matter. Um, so let's find the number of wavelengths. So I'm going to take this length divided by lambda to figure out what fraction of a wavelength it is. The wavelength is, um, you know, essentially 1 times 10 to the minus 6, 1 micrometer, a little bit over 1,000 nanometers. So this divided by this, plugging those in, still gets me to... So I'm going to keep the 4, but I really just care about the power of 10, um, 10 to the minus 14 of um, 1 wavelength. Right. So it's a tiny, tiny, tiny change in the phase. Unimaginably small. Yet remarkably, we can detect this. Um, so I guess one of the one from just an engineering standpoint of this of high precision engineering, we are extremely good at detecting small changes in phase difference. So this is the smallest we can detect roughly, you know, within the sort of power of ten. Of course, it's extremely difficult to do. And there are lots of factors that mess with the data, right? So they're analyzing a continuous stream of data that essentially detects the interference pattern here. And there are all sorts of bumps and uh, messy errors in it. Why? I mean, imagine there's a 
there's the slightest of earthquakes and you know washington state has a lot of earthquakes little ones every little vibration gets picked up now the mirrors they're damped right so you don't vibrate very much from passing trucks unlike the um the 1881 experiment where the passing wagon outside messed with it right it's super precise but because of this extraordinarily degree of precision needed to detect those those tiny um, gravitational waves you know the, the data is what we call noisy there's a lot of stuff in it but by analyzing you know what's what since you're doing some statistical analysis you can find points that are out of the ordinary that that are contenders to be gravitational waves and then to make the search possible to sort of confirm that we're looking at the right thing what what we have is we don't have one of those we've got three of those right so let me draw the earth um so here's here's going to be america um this is like the west coast and then there's sort of um mexico down here right and it's florida um and here it goes up Hudson bay you get the idea um so there's one here there's hanford Um, in in Washington, so this is um, Washington. This is LIGO in Hanford. There's another LIGO in Louisiana. Those were the first two. I don't know what town it is, and I should have looked this up. Um, you can look it up on the website, right? Now you've got to go to the website. Um, and then later they added another one over here. So over here is going to going to draw Europe. This is Spain. This is Italy. Um, there's the Adriatic coast. Here's, um, here's you know, um, Africa. You get the idea. Uh, worst drawing of Africa ever. Right, this is Africa. Um, and so on. Right, there's one in Italy here, which is um, Virgo. I actually don't know where exactly in Italy it is again. But those three together, right, they exist. And they're sharing data. And then what happens is a gravitational wave passes through the Earth. And so depending on what direction it comes from, this one might detect it first. Might say, oop, there's a spike in our data. And then they ask, well, was it just noise? You know, did it, did it was a little earthquake or is it a gravitational wave or something else? But then gravitational waves move at the speed of light. A certain time later, the Louisiana um, facility detects it. And you can cross-reference the times. And a little time later, the Hanford side detects it. And you can cross-reference those signals. Hey, we all saw the same thing. So it's not an earthquake. Right? So you rule out uh, because the, the data here um, corresponds to, to each other. They see the same thing, but shifted by time. And depending on at what times the different sites get hit by the same data, you can sort of tell which way did the, did the, did the, um, did the gravitational wave come from. Once you've done that analysis, you can then ask your telescopes, or what, again, like Hawaii, or Antarctica, or wherever your favorite telescope is, or maybe out in space, um, to look in that direction to see if you can get an electromagnetic signal as well, like see it, as well as feel it um, via this. I mean, this is cutting-edge science, right? This is amazing stuff, uh, the precision to which we can measure that. And because you've studied waves, you understand what's going on there. All right, thanks for watching.